the church in Klingenberg in 19, 2019 in Franconia, where he was baptized. And in the church where he once played the organ, um, in the church where he once played the organ, and the service was led by one of his students, uh, Mark Elo Aris, Elko Aris. Now, I was struck by a photo at the front of the church, and it was a portrait of Werner Bayerwalters. And his face seemed all seeing. It took me back to my student days in a seminar in Munich on Nicholas of Cusa's De Visioni Dei. Uh, Cusa was a central emphasis on Bayerwalters. Perhaps the next slide, please, Dominic. Now, the icon of Christ in that work, the De Visioni Dei, uh, as a work dedicated to the monks of Tegensee, is presented as an image of the providence of the deity. In the seminar, we explored Cusa's familiar notion of God as a coincidentia oppositorum, the breaching of Aristotelian categories through a Neoplatonic negative theology. God is at once the idem, the same as the absolute identity, possessed as the ground of all reality, actual and potential, and non aliud, the radically transcendent presence as the not other. So the icon presented to the monks at Tegensee was a token of the unity of the soul's vision and the vision of God, the opening up of thought and self-reflection to the incommensurable principle and source of being, to the ineffable and to the unsayable ariton. This furnishes the fundamentally religious dimension of Bayerwalter's philosophizing. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. Neoplatonism represents for Bayerwalter's the culmination of antique thought. Rather than the quasi-romantic vision of Edward Zeller, um, a view of Neoplatonism as the decline and the degenerate phase of philosophy that had long seen its apex in Plato and Aristotle, and then entered into a period of relative decline in speculative power while maintaining some conceptual finesse in the Hellenistic period, and then ultimately collapsing into a farrago of superstition, mysticism, and scholasticism in Plotinus and Com Proclus, Bayerwalters saw, in contrast to this vision of Zella, Neoplatonism, and especially the thought of Plotinus and Proclus, as the continuation of genuine aspects of Platonic, Aristotelian, and Stoic thought. He was not, however, interested in presenting Platonism as the sole legitimate philosophical strand in Western culture. Bayerwalters was acutely aware of the alternatives to Platonism, which were frequently more influential or prominent, whether in the guise of the philosophy of Aristotle, in the Aristotelianism of late antiquity, or the Christian or Arab Jewish Middle Ages, or in the early modern period, or indeed the long lasting influence of the ethics of Stoicism or Epicureanism. Philosophy was not, for Bayerwalters, necessarily opposed to faith, but nor did he see Christianity as compatible with any philosophical system. Bayerwalters was espousing the argument of the Alexandrian Christians throughout the ages that faith required its old loving nurse, the Platonic philosophy. And he presents Platonism as the rational yearning for transcendence in the contemplation of the divine, and indeed to become what one beholds. Given his conviction that Christian thought had poor prospects without the buttress of metaphysics, Bayerwalters was at odds with many of the major concerns of his philosophical contemporaries. While some of his colleagues at the University of Munich shared his enthusiasm for metaphysics, influential writers like Dieter Henrich, Robert Spemann, and Wolfhard Pannenberg, the second half of the 20th century was generally shaped by the widespread critique of metaphysics, whether coming from existentialism, phenomenology, hermeneutics, ordinary language philosophy, 
or neo-Marxist social constructionism, all disavowing unashamed metaphysics, which seemed increasingly the stubborn preserve of neo-scholasticism and the odd brilliant maverick, such as Wolfgang Kramer or Vittorio Hersley. Biovaltus was either impatient with or irritated by these dismissals of metaphysics. Yet neither was he impressed by attempts to ignore the history of philosophy. In that respect, he was within the general and respectful orbit of Gadamer and the idea of philosophy as hermeneutical. One might say that the purpose of the history of philosophy was to explore the key questions of the subject that tend to be obscured in any age by the ephemeral interests and obsessions of the zeitgeist, the ex exigencies of economy and the execration of the worldly wise. Yet the neglect of the great abiding concerns of philosophy meant the denigration of the soul for the interests of the body, self, or society. If Gadamer presents a vision of philosophy as essentially hermeneutical, the learned and nuanced renegotiation of ancient texts, Biovaltus was always passionately summoning the perennial metaphysical questions lying behind the texts, thinking the one, identity and difference, self-knowledge, and the experience of the one, that is, the theory of the absolute, truth, and the vocation of the soul. There are two modern critics of Platonism who play a significant role in Biovalter's oeuvre. Next slide, please, Dominic. Heidegger's densely poetic and uh, obscure summoning of a return to being rather than beings, and indeed the endeavor to think the difference between being and beings was of particular significance for Biovalter's as a crypto-neoplatonic endeavor. Biovalter's was acutely aware of the genius of Heidegger, and there was, I think, an elective affinity. It was the opposite of the enthusiasm of French post-structuralists for the end of metaphysics. It was in conscious opposition to the Procrustean end of metaphysics narrative of Heidegger, and in a sense, because of the persistent aspects of Meister Eckhart or Schelling in Heidegger's thought, that Heidegger remained a presence for Biowalters. The Heideggerian critique of metaphysics served only to reinforce for Biowalters the need for metaphysics. And it was not, in fact, the early Heidegger of being and time, as we have up there, uh, but the later critic of Plato that drew Biowalters' fire. It was the philosopher who introduced the concept ontotheological and held that metaphysics, on account of its ontotheological character, i.e. that it allegedly has always thought of being as something and this something as God and has never been able to think being. As a result, it succumbed to forgetfulness of being. That's, of course, the Heideggerian narrative. Biowalter subjects this thesis to withering and trenchant critique. As long as Heidegger himself, Biowalter's notes, is unable to shed more light upon what being is, one must consider the possibility that Neoplatonism and thinkers in its wake, such as Cusa or Meister Eckhart, were able to free themselves from the forgetfulness of being through their concept of beyond being. Plotinus, after all, refers to the one explicitly as not something in any categorical sense of a thing, hen as pro to t in Ennead. 5, 3, 12, 52. Just as being, Heidegger insists, cannot be something. Or indeed, are we supposed to consider the unum or the non alium or idem, which for Eckhart and Cusanus is the designation of God as something? The influence of Heidegger on Biowalters, however, is deeper than one might assume on the basis of the largely critical perspective of his commentary on the Meister from Meskirch. The critique of Heidegger in Biowalters is often a radical and remorseless critique of Heidegger's capacity to eclipse the brilliant attic light with black forest tenebrosity. Biowalters investigates Heidegger's return to the pre-Socratics with a ruthless exposure of Heidegger's philological limitations, often attributable to Heidegger's use of Wilhelm Pappe's Griechisch-Deutsches Handwörterbuch sometimes 
critiquing Heidegger's quasi-romantic fantasies about archaic Greek thought, or simply Heidegger's Procrustean tendency to project his own ideas and obsessions into his favorite texts. While sensitive to the ethical ambivalence of Heidegger's desire to overcome technical rationality, Beiwalters was affected by the desire of the Schwarzwald sage to awaken the sense of wonder as the very engine of philosophy and the attunement to the logos as the speech of being and the awareness of the ineffable source of meaning. This was a deep aspect of the philosophical program of Beiwalters. In that respect, Beiwalters, despite his profound misgivings and criticisms, shared a kindred vision of philosophy to that of Heidegger, worn opposed to the varieties of positivism, existentialism, or sociological uh, Marxism that were ubiquitous in German academia in the latter part of the last century. Dominic, could we go on to the next slide, please? The next slide. Speculative theology is my next uh, heading. Sorry. Now, ah. that's right. So, Schelling. So, yeah. So here in the middle of these, uh, this slide, we have a magnificent portrait of the German romantic Friedrich uh, Wilhelm Josef von Schelling. And that's a portrait that you can find in the Neue Pinakothek in Munich. Now, speculative theology may look like an aberration of 90, the 19th century. In his work, Platonismus and Christentum, Bayerwalters argues that the development of Christian theology is unthinkable without the contribution of Platonism. Now, that's an entirely defensible position. While religion is important for philosophy, philosophy is also crucial for theology. One only has to think of the Alexandrians, Augustine, or Boethius to recognize the significance of Platonism for these early Christian theologians. Yet can philosophy continue to sustain such a role? Has that element of the inherited synthesis become irritating or alienating for Christian theology? Has not the Kantian critique of dogmatic metaphysics brought the sterile glass bead game of speculative theology to an end? Has the ancient question of the relation of the one to the many been replaced by the interplay of subject and object? Well, Bayerwald has refused to accept such a verdict, nor would he accept that religious truth is merely poetic or imaginative in the sense that it expresses ideals with no correlate in reality. Post-Kantian thought, especially Schelling and Hegel, are pivotal for his own philosophical justification for theology. The Aristotelian Actus Purus evolves in Neoplatonism and then for Bayerwalters finds powerful expression in Hegel's objective idealism and Schelling's philosophy of revelation. The question of God or the philosophical absolute is for Bayerwalters the central philosophical question. At the center of Bayerwalters' oeuvre is his presentation of Plotinus' theme of the self-transcendence of thought prepared by and grounded in reflection of the one itself. And as such, the highest philosophical activity of Plotinus has a religious dimension, as it does in those thinkers in the later tradition, such as Eckhart or Nicholas of Cusa. Bayerwaltus is even prepared to use the term mysticism in contrast to Kurt Flasch's polemic against placing, for example, Meister Eckhart in the milieu of German mysticism. Not that Bayerwaltus would argue with the masterful presentation of Eckhart's debt to Arabic Aristotelian theology of intellect inherited from Albert the Great or Dietrich of Freiburg with the work of Kurt Flasch. But for Bayerwalters, the notion of religion as inspiration for life and a consolation in the midst of suffering forms part of the hermeneutical task. So while Bayerwalters was not hostile to the legacy of the European Enlightenment, he was conscious of the spiritual sclerosis engendered by the cultural despisers of religion as well as by the dogmatic defenses of Christianity. Philosophy is, on this model, the initiation into the unsayable, the Areton. Yet this, for Barrywalters, is in no way a denial of the various attempts to understand being as logos, hen, idea, 
Prote, Osea, or Nous. Platonism should be understood as the search for the primordial first principle, the proton, and in this sense, philosophy is properly protology. So while generally sympathetic to the concerns of the so-called Tübingen uh, Plato school, Biovaltus did not see the need to reconstruct the true Plato from reports of the Agrafa Dogmata in the manner of Kramer and Geyser. Since Anax Anaximander had identified the first principle with, uh, with uh, Theon or Theos, and thus protology was by definition theology. And Biovaltus thought that Plato's theology should be viewed as a bearer of a tradition of speculation that had pre-Socratic sources and which exhibited a natural development in the Neoplatonist and Christian theology. In his crucial work, Identity and Difference, Identity and Difference, composed in the fruitful middle period of his career, Biovaltus explores the categories of Plato's uh, Megistagene in his Sophist as Plato's revision and correction of Parmenides' conception of being, whereby being corresponds to identity and no non-being to difference. The Plotinian vision of the timeless intellect thinking itself furnishes a model of reflexive difference in unity. The ideas, the divine ideas are different and yet form a translucent unity. As the second form of unity, the intellect is other than the one, and yet still profoundly bound to its source. This relation of identity to difference finds a striking burgeoning in Trinitarian thought in relation to the question of unity. Biovaltus viewed Plotinus's notion of the one as the ground of itself in the beginning of a development witnessed in Marius Victorinus, Johannes Scotus Eriuta, Meister Eckhart, and Nicholas of Cusa, God as Trinitarian self-constitution. This self-constitution of the first principle, theories of being, thought, and the one, derived mainly from the Platonist tradition, were deployed to explicate this divine first principle. So in Christianity, just as philosophy was a legitimate organ of articulation of historical revelation, so too philosophical reflection remains ineluctable. One might note from the outset that Biovaltus is opposed to both those who would attempt to separate and distinguish the genuinely Christian from the Hellenic accretion, and those who would oppose Hellenic pagan polytheism to Judeo-Christian Abrahamic monotheism, such as uh, Gemistus Plato or Thomas Taylor. Part of the significance for the Platonic tradition for Biovaltus lay precisely in the subterranean nature of its influence. In the Christian world, Origen, Dennis the Areopagite, Augustine and Boethius drank deeply from Platonic sources. Medieval Christian thinkers usually draw, drew upon a Platonism that had already been baptized, as it were, and was not present as pagan or in contrast to scripture. Yet the fruits of this plundering of the Egyptians were genuinely philosophical for Biovaltus. The efforts of Eriogena or Anselm were no less metaphysical by virtue of the theological context of their reception of certain ideas and arguments. At the same time, Biovaltus was robustly opposed to the association of Platonism with Hermeticism or Esotericism. For Biovaltus, as I've said, Neoplatonism is no degenerate or grotesque version of late antique irrationalism. The preservation and sublimation of the metaphysics of Plato, especially the doctrine of the three hypostases of the one intellect and the soul as derived from the Parmenides, and as such as a resolutely theological structure. As a result, for all his respect for Gadamer, in some respects, he is closer to the Tübingen school in his approach to Plato, although Biovaltus rarely refers to that circle. The one is the transcendent absolute resisting conceptual comprehension. The intellect is the locus of the identity of being and thought, the plenitude of ideas. The notion of the dynamic and relational identity of the intellect was thus of momentous significance for Christian thought as truth. So rather than the mod model of the adequatio re et intellectus, the correspondence of thing and intellect pilloried by Heidegger, truth is the convergence and coherence of the ideas within the divine mind. This coherence model of truth is infused with the Old Testament paradigm of divine truth as unswerving faithfulness to his people through the Logos principle in John's gospel and the recurring theme of the evangelists and St. Paul that 
um, that one can then associate with the exegesis of Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. And in his Platonism and Idealism, uh, he expounds this notion of the essential intelligibility of being as such. So there's a contrast, one might say, with the French tradition of Neoplatonism with its frequent stress on the apophatic and the theurgic liturgical dimension of late antique thought. Weyvalt has had little patience for the theurgical dimension of Neoplatonism, especially in Iamblichus. And in the true self, he quotes the words of Plotinus that uh, contemplation alone is not to be bewitched. So the Neoplatonism of Biovaltus is shaped by this tradition of German idealism with its emphasis upon uh, the intellect or what Hegel calls the begriff. This can be seen in his early work on Proclus, a dialectician so explicitly admired by Hegel. And Schelling's own complex and often conflicted approach to Neoplatonism was viewed by Biovaltus as a genuine instance of this living tradition of thought. Schelling was in both entirely modern, a product of Kant and the French Revolution, while being an heir to Neoplatonism. Hegel had open admiration for Platonic dialectic, which is movement from the particular to the objective, and in particular for Hegel, the Platonic critique of Parmenides through the definition of non-being as difference in Plato's sophist and its mobilization in the Neoplatonic notion of intellect as constituted by difference in, in, in identity, and thus, Hegel could see much of his own dialectic as having its roots in Plato's Parmenides. Indeed, a brief glance at his lectures on the history of philosophy show Hegel's recognition of the great value of Neoplatonism. And while Schelling's precise relationship to the Neoplatonic inheritance is ambivalent and critical, as is his early study of Plato's Timaeus and his work Bruno Evince, yet Schelling's philosophy of art and his philosophy of nature um, it, are areas where he pursues and develops genuinely Neoplatonic themes. Now, um, the step between the Renaissance, uh, where we obviously have a Platonic tradition, and the uh, German idealists is a gap in Biowalter's narrative. And uh, I would like to think that some of the work that I've been doing on the Cambridge Platonism and their influence via Shaftesbury helps to explain that link between the uh, Florentine revival of Platonism and the Platonism that we find in the Romantic uh, era. So um, let me turn on now to the question of uh, aesthetics and let me turn on to the next slide. So, Dominic, so the next slide in the... the Sorry, it's just being a bit slow. Yeah, that's fine. Now, the religious and the aesthetic constitute a crucial part of Biowalter's oeuvre. Music was a great personal importance to him, and his fascination for Theodor, Theodor Adorno was doubtless linked to this. Adorno is critiqued by Biowalters in proximity to Heidegger. Biowalters views Adorno's opposition to the concept of identity as, and the promotion of the non-identical uh, as a basic category of thought. So identity becomes the scapegoat for the ills of philosophy and society in Horkheimer's and Adorno's dialectic of enlightenment through the idea of thought as an instrument of oppression that regulates all items under the power of the ruling subject. So identity becomes the instrument of identifying the real and thereby enabling a totalizing synthesis, excluding all those objects that do not fit and essentially opposing critique. Art for Adorno is absorbed into this total society and therefore robbed of its capacity for critique. In his reversal of Hegel, Adorno claims that the whole is the false. The realization of what Adorno calls the non-identical can break, however, the compulsion for identity 
from which man suffers in his present situation in society. Bayer-Walters takes Adorno's non-identical um, as a paradigm of the relationship between identity and difference, tautotes and heterotes, from the sophist in 20th century thought. And deploying the concept of the non-identical, Adorno seeks to explain historical and social phenomena in a universal manner. If it's explicitly uh, anti-Hegelian, the debt to Hegelian dialectic remains. Bayer-Walters, however, also notes the striking parallel between Adorno's privileging of the artwork and Schelling's vision of art as the organon of philosophy. Schell Adorno's notion of the non-identical as peculiarity that resists conceptual thought and Adorno's vision of music as a privileged expression of the non-identical means that art, in fact, is cognitive. And even if the pessimistic mood of Adorno's philosophy furnishes a close link with Schopenhauer, Adorno's ambivalent but potent association with Hegel is still evident. And the relation to Schelling is less often noted, but as Bayer-Walters makes the connection quite explicitly. For Bayer-Walters, beauty is the expression of the eternal in the transient, the promise that we can feel at home in the world. But that is a very different aesthetic to Adorno's. There's also a bond with Heidegger here. Bayer-Walters notes that the pathos of authentic art is, a, is important for Adorno, not least in his savage critique of the amusement and consumption of the so-called culture industry. Now, notwithstanding his celebrated critique of the jargon of authenticity, the jargon der Eigentlichkeit in Heidegger, one should not think of um, Heidegger and Adorno simply as foils for Bayer-Walters. Notwithstanding the manifold difference between these two German thinkers, Bayer-Walters wants to make it clear that their respective critiques of metaphysics have much in common. They both summon the concepts of identity and difference to describe the alienation of man that emerges from the reign of being in modern technology, that's Heidegger, or the context of involvement and deception in society, Adorno. They both, moreover, wish to be harbingers of a new being. Reflection upon the consistent consciousness of non-identity for Adorno is meant to breach this alienation and foster social renewal. And Bayer-Walter sees Adorno as a kindred effort to Heidegger's intention of saving man from the compulsions of technical planning and calculating by virtue of thinking ahead, looking toward that which approaches us as the call of the active nature of identity between man and being, whereby this identity designates the willingness to be open to being, which entails the thinking of difference as difference. So here we touch on this uh, interesting, I think complicated question of the uh, quite savage critique of both Heidegger and Adorno and yet um, uh, Bayer-Walter's own sympathy to both of them. And I think uh, here we touch on the close link between Muthos and Logos. In Plato's Phaedrus, we find a combination of both rational arguments and imaginative stories about the soul and its vocation. The myths of Plato are a rather odd form of the genre and are clearly shaped by the demands of a rigorous philosophical project. Reason, on the other hand, should not be construed too narrowly for Biovalters in terms of conceptual analysis or observation, since science and morality rely on principles which defy strict explication. That is to say, we should not confuse reason with rationality in the narrow instrumental sense that has become so widespread since the European uh, Enlightenment. Rationality is more than a narrow calculating scientific rationality. It relies upon the revival of a distinction between noose and dianoia, between reason and understanding. Plato's seventh letter on the reasonable assumption of its authenticity presents a model of the kindling of insight that cannot be identified with patterns of deduction or empirical induction. And this account of intuitive cognition is reinforced by the Neoplatonic interpretation of Plato's Parmenides, and in particular Plotinus on the apprehension of the one. One might add that the religious imagination must be guided 
by both noose and dianoia, by both reason and understanding, if it is not to collapse into fantasy and wish fulfillment. Both the skiller of relativism and skepticism of the postmodern ideologues um, and the Charybdis of narrow scientific materialism and utilitarianism must be confronted with the intellectual resources of the philosophical tradition. My next section is called Epochs of Thought and Subjectivity. Dominic, if we could go to the next slide, please. So Bayer-Walters, for all his philological precision and nuanced historical awareness, was loath to envisage the conceptual apparatus of an epoch of philosophy as constituting a Nietzschean prison house of thought. So while he was emphatically not a perennialist, he was nevertheless conscious of continuities between ancient, medieval, and modern culture. He spoke warmly of Hans Blumenberg, once a colleague in Münster, even though that seemed to me a rather unlikely intellectual uh, kinship. Platonismus and Idealismus is a normative programmatic as well as a descriptive title. Both Blumenberg and Bayer-Walters had a great interest in the history of philosophy and interest in metaphors. But Blumenberg's anthropological and epistemological pessimism was far removed from Bayer-Walters, for whom Neoplatonism furnished a structure for Christianity to emerge as the religion of antiquity. As we have noticed, here was a counter-argument to figures like Heinrich Dürer, who, who viewed the relation between Christianity and Platonism as irrevocably antagonistic and hostile. Thus, for Bayer-Walters, Neoplatonism was not just a culmination of antiquity, but provided a basis for the inheritance of Greco-Roman antiquity in the Gothic Middle Ages. One might add that Islam and Judaism relied heavily upon Neoplatonic structures as the Christian West, as much as the Christian West, but apart from his work on the Liber de Causis, his research was focused on the Christian West. The next great era in Bayer-Walters' depiction of the development of the history of thought is the Renaissance. It should be noticed that this is quite unusual. In many uh, histories of philosophy, the Renaissance is a rather neglected period. Could we go back to Dürer? Uh, I think we, oh yeah, great, great. Um, so in many uh, histories of philosophy, the, the Renaissance is rather uh, neglected, sort of between the medieval period and uh, the early modern philosophy, starting off with Galileo and Descartes. But for Bayer-Walters, the Renaissance is a pivotal element in Western thought, not least because of the rediscovery of Platonism. It is Ficino in whom the philosophy of the Renaissance became a Renaissance of Platonism. And uh, Ficino was a master interpreter of both Plato and Plotinus. Bayer-Walters clearly relished the magnificent achievement of the Italian Renaissance as philosophy in action. Well, as I said, Nicholas of Cusa was one of his favorite philosophers, and Cusa stands on the threshold of the medieval and the Renaissance. Ficino, Reuchlin, Pico, and Bruno are significant figures for him. And there was a Christian humanism that he saw in the works of Michelangelo, and the stress in Bayer-Walters upon the Renaissance was not just a willful occlusion of the 17th century, as much as a different perspective. Not so much the separation of facts from value or the gap between the rationality of science and any vision of the good that emerges from the esprit géométrique of early modern science. What represented the distinctively modern for Bayer-Walters was the spirit of subjectivity, creativity and freedom as it came to glorious fruition in the Renaissance. He greatly admired one of the treasures of the Alta Pinacothek, uh, the self-portrait of Albrecht Dürer. Now look at, it. this is the portrait in the middle of the slide. And there's in fact an addendum to this essay, um, on, an essay on Nicholas of Cusa, on the possible connection between the self-portrait of Albrecht Dürer and the thought of Cusa. Now, the portrait is very enigmatic. It's both personal and universal. Dürer is clearly using the artistic conventions of the depiction of Christ in the period. Now, Bayer-Walters notes that the criticism of arrogance or even blasphemy in the self-portrait could be countered by the idea of the imitatio Christi, according to which the image represents the archetype and telos of human life. And Bayer-Walters links this to the central idea of the 
filiatio dei as the expression of the supreme human potential. So here's uh, what he says. In relation to the self-portrait of Dürer, the image of Christ appears as the truth of godlikeness, both from the perspective of the a priori foundation and the finite experience thereof. It is the presentation of the unity of both glances or faces. So here is the coincidence of the finite and the infinite, the renewal of the finite in the infinite through the process of deification. This is not the I that sees not itself, Julius Caesar, Act 1, Scene 2, but the validation of the immortal longings that we find in Antony and Cleopatra in the vision of God. So, um, so the, the, uh, um, this, this emphasis upon the uh, Renaissance is um, significant for him because the, the modernity is neither the secularization of medieval Christianity, so uh, Lovit, nor is it the legitimate break from it, as in Blumenberg. For Bayevalters, there's clearly been a loss of the sense of transcendence in European thought, and this has driven a new kind of wedge between philosophy and theology, one that would have perplexed Eriogena, Eckhart, Kuzer, or Ficino. At the same time, Bayevalters was just as hostile to gloomy or reactionary dismissals of the modern age, denoid sight, as much as he disapproved of the rebarbative Marxism critiques of bourgeois enlightenment in Foucault or Derrida. Whatever he shared with Heidegger and Adorno, it was not their deep pessimism about Western uh, civilization. The true self and the problem of the soul. For Bayevalters, it's an error to envisage the thought of Plotinus in particular as merely cerebral adumbration of a static hierarchy of metaphysical abstractions, hypostases stretching from the one to the intellect and the soul. Instead, we should envisage the philosophy of Plotinus as the thinking of the one and the intellect through the soul for the sake of a life lived in accordance with the good. Like Pierre Adot, Bayevalters wanted to stress the practical and transformative aspects of Plotinus' philosophy. Yet unlike Adorn, and in accordance with the German idealist inheritance, Bayevalters lays greater stress upon the idea of subjectivity. For him, the self-scrutiny of thought itself, the exploration and analysis of its own a priori structure is part of the warp and woof of the Neoplatonism of Plotinus. And while most would consider the procession of reality from the one as the key issue in Neoplatonism, Bayevalters insists that this must be discussed with relation to man's own self-knowledge, i.e. in a reflection upon an awareness of that principle that is working imminently within while transcending finite subjectivity. In the enigmatic core of our nature, we are rooted in him by converging towards him. That's from Plotinus. This consciousness of the transcendent absolute furnishes the rationale for the Plotinian imperative which accompanies and inspires an abine pros ekenon, ascend to him. And the monograph, the true self, is concerned with the relation between the soul and the intellect as the traditional Platonic interpretation of the Delphic imperative, know thyself. This for Bayevald is emphatically not the self as an impervious or impenetrable datum of much psychological, economic, or political theorizing but as an idea that emerges through the ascent of the soul to the noetic world and more mysteriously to the one itself. Here is a doctrine of a higher and lower self, which Bayevalters presents as common to Christianity and Platonism. It forms a bridge to one of the key themes of modern philosophy, subjectivity. The great American idealist Josiah Royce wrote, the higher self, and think of the image of Dürer as I read these words of, of Royce, the higher self, the deeper spiritual nature, the individuality which ought to be, to whom does it originally belong? To the man who finally wins a consciousness that this has become to him his true self. Or does this higher self come, as Aristotle said, of the nous thurafen, from without, into the natural man? Royce continues, and the two doctrines which in our European history have most insisted upon the duality of our higher and lower selfhood, 
this, the ethical teachings of Plato and the gospel of the Christian church, have agreed in insisting that the higher self is a resultant of influences which belong to the eternal world and which the eternal man himself is powerless to initiate. It is in this spirit that Eckhart can say that God is within, but we are without. The acquisition of the true self is to be attained by the allegiance to that truth, beauty, and goodness, which is higher than the immediate ego or self. In his exposition of the doctrine of the intellect in Plotinus, Bayevaltas lays weight upon the principles of absolute value, truth, wisdom, beauty, loving union as aspects of the intellect. This is both an epistemological and ethical thesis. The empirical world is, in certain respects, obscure and refractory. The frailty of human epistemic capacities is such that mere correlation can be confused with causation, or statistical coincidences can seem like laws of nature. The mind is prone, as both Plato and Bacon insist, to idols. The capacity of the mind to penetrate the veil of appearances, if reality, the world of value and fact, is not the product of human contrivance, and the very confidence that science and ethics are possible relies upon the conviction that the human mind is attuned to the design and the maker of the universe. Owen Barfield once observed that words are only themselves by being more than themselves. Perhaps the same is true of human beings, and perhaps that's the spiritual meaning of Dürer's self-portrait. The point is that mere sounds or characters, words have little significance. It is because of what the words convey that they have power. Yet perhaps the same is true of human beings. We indeed are merely hairless apes languishing in Pascal's dismal eternal silence of the infinite spaces of the universe. Yet the articulation of sound and form is also the summoning of the logos that was begotten, not made, and that very pattern by which, according to the Gospel of John, all things have been created. I conclude. Werner Bayevald has spent his entire life studying Platonic and Neoplatonic texts. These are texts that he approached as a live philosophical option, not as a mere exposition and exploration of ideas in Plato that came to be developed by the Neoplatonists and exerted an influence on Christian thought and German idealism. Without ever posturing about his metaphysical commitments and harboring a deep suspicion about philosophical dogmatism, Bayevaltas Erfo is committed to a particular vision of philosophy. One might crudely distinguish between three philosophical approaches to reality, and I'll call them for this evening's lecture, affirmation, renunciation, and participation. The first endorses the world, the second renounces the world, the third views, as, views the world as a stage of redemption and renewal. Firstly, the affirmation of the world. Bayevaltas grew up during the dark days of oppression and war in Germany, and upon becoming a university teacher, he encountered the turbulence and frenzy of the student riots. Um, I remember him talking um, quite traumatized about the, those experiences. But he could not expect the view, he could not accept the view presented by philosophers such as Protagoras, Hobbes, Spinoza, or the Amor Fati of Nietzsche, that the world we encounter should be affirmed as it appears, vexing, rebarbative, full of violence and injustice. Two, renunciation. Nor could Bayevaltas accept the ethics of resignation and renunciation, the idea that the world we encounter should be renounced in favor of forbearance and compassion. If Bayevaltas is sympathetic to the term mysticism, it's not because he wishes to deny the gap between the is and the ought. Nor would he endorse the melancholy code of the proud Stoics. The growing popularity of Buddhism in the West, from Schopenhauer to Wagner to the American counterculture, perhaps reflects this option of resignation. Now, the metaphysics of Bayevaltas is neither the Amor Fati nor the Stoic renunciation, but one of participation. Lying behind his magisterial overview uh, and analysis of the great Platonic, Neoplatonic, idealistic strand of Western thought rests the conviction that the world we encounter is an imperfect image of its transcendent archetype. We can reckon on this model of reality presented by uh, Plotinus and St. Paul, 
that the world contains real enigmas and real obscurity. Yet we should expect intimation and tokens of the one and reflections of the eternal logos that pervade the phenomena of experience. Piety on this model is not the adversary of, of philosophical cognition. Bywald has referred to both the metaphysics and, and his ethics as the realisierung des Bildes, the realization of the image. The visible world is a theophany. Our senses are neither sundered from the sensible nor the intelligible worlds. I remember visits to Würzburg at the end of his life and the delight that Werner Beiwald has exhibited in showing me the magnificent palace and chapel in the residence with its sacral baroque. I recall his pleasure in the midst of the great fresco of Tiepolo of the Four Continents and remembering his account of how close to destruction this artwork had been through the bombing raids of the Second World War. There were buildings that evoke the sense of drama, exuberance and grandeur of the love that moves the sun and other stars for all its worldly magnificence, yet betokening a reality beyond the material cosmos. Thank you very much. Mm.